extra, extra, read all about it. No, you're not going to read about it. I'm making a video so you can watch it. You can listen to me if you want. It's up to you because we have freedom, or at least we have some freedom right now. Who knows what that'll be like tomorrow or next week, whatever. Anyway, I'm going to make this statement that I have nothing personally against Ukraine. My issue is with the very fake, corrupt, propaganda lying media in the West and our politicians who are very same. They lie, they say propaganda. They wouldn't know truth if it bashed them in the side of the head. So that's my issue. Again, I'm not picking on Ukraine. I can tell you, be, being born in Hungary, there's some really nasty people in Hungary also. Whether they're bigger crooks or smaller ones. Back in the 70s, we were taking a taxi. I got ripped off by the taxi driver because in the dark, I confused money and way overpaid him. And that's just the way it goes. Anyway, it happens everywhere. There's good Canadians, there's bad Canadians. Same with U.S. I care about the country and the general population who have no say, nothing to do with all the evils that their governments, their media, their corporations perpetrate around the world. Corporations. You know, they're involved in poisoning land, air, everything, governments, media. So let's get on with video. Or, or George, First of all, either of you, for yes. the United States to threaten to impose sanctions on India for its purchase of Russian arms, it is completely an act of irresponsibility. Why? Because the United States does not have any legal it standing. It wasn't specifically on, on India. It wasn't to specifically impose sanctions on India. On India for buying weapons from Russia. So, the United States but, but need we, to wake up. Didn't. It's we no didn't. longer a world dictated by the United States. It's a world in which the United I mean, States say that, need to treat India as an equal. Respect to India. And I'm saying this from China's perspective. Respect to India as a great country. Don't manhandle India. We, Don't we do. lecture we India. Do. Don't dictate your terms to India. Don't threaten to impose sanctions your sanctions are laughing stocks in the world. Days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the ruble was at an all-time low. It shared 45% of its value against the dollar. The collapse was an indication of Russia's economic isolation. The US president even went ahead to dismiss the Russian currency, calling it rubble. But since then, the currency has bounced back. It is now trading just at its pre-war levels, closing at 79.7 .7 to the dollar in Moscow. But how exactly did this happen? This is because despite the wide-ranging sanctions, Russia is still exporting gas and oil. Many are calling it the country's economic resilience. Yeah, the economic sanctions uh, that destroyed the ruble didn't seem to work that well. Although Trudeau and Biden take credit for, oh yeah, we busted the Russian economy. Now, if you're noticing, I'm taking a lot of videos and watching a lot of news programs from India. They are far ahead and far above what our propaganda channels and reporters say here in the West. That includes Canada, the US, uh, even uh, UK, wherever. And it is very impressive. India has a population of 1.4 billion people. There is a lot of poverty. But there is also a lot of young, educated people in IT, in health, medicine, sciences, everything. India is moving ahead. Not only China, but also India. We have to pay attention to them. Thank you very much. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for joining the Stand Up for Ukraine pledging event. We're here today to answer President Zelensky's call for the international community to mobilize in support for Ukrainian refugees and all Ukrainians. Vladimir Putin's war has created a humanitarian crisis. When I was in Warsaw just last month, I met people that had left their homes with only a backpack. It was all they had for their most important belongings. They shared incredibly 
difficult stories with me. They don't know when they'll return home to their husbands, their sons, their fathers, and they don't know what the future holds. Does Ukraine have biological weapons? The answer was a very carefully phrased, Ukraine has biological research facilities, after which Senator Rubio has himself gave her the exit clause by putting the blame on Russia, potentially doing a false flag operation in the future. Ms. Parthmore, clearly the American government is not being able to deny the fact that Ukraine has biological research facilities which can possibly be used in biological warfare as well. That's quite clear. I'd like your response, please. Yeah, let me be absolutely clear um, in very direct language. We do not believe that the Ukrainians have biological weapons programs. They have been a champion for non-proliferation since they became an independent nation. I absolutely do not believe that there are any biological weapons activities that have been conducted at any of these laboratories uh, as assisted by the United States or by the Ukrainians. What are biolabs? What are the biolabs which are there in, yeah. um, in Ukraine? Can you tell us more about what these biolabs are? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the original impetuses for setting up these laboratories in the former Soviet Union was because of the, the Soviet biological weapons program. They had huge industrial scale biological weapons facilities in places like Kazakhstan. And we've been concerned uh, over, the, over the years, including because they established and expanded these programs after signing the biological weapons program. We've been very concerned that Russia may still have a biological weapons program. But that's not the primary purpose. That's one no, driver why, no, setting up these no, no, laboratories. Why, why, what they, are the bio labs? What you have been, uh, Ms. Parthmore, Ms. Parthmore, what are the bio labs? There are 16 of them. 16 of yeah, them. Yeah, so they absolutely. On, America, they just, on Ukrainian soil, am I correct? Correct. Just as uh, labs around India what do they conduct, conduct research for public health purposes, they conduct public health research similar to labs all around the world that do public health research. Now that's very generic. Can they you be more specific than that? Can you be Absolutely. more specific so, than that? What is, what, yeah, what do they study? Absolutely. Uh, they study influenzas and other pathogens that have the risk of affecting humans and animals and livestock and agriculture. They essentially serve as an early warning system uh, and does for this study disease outbreaks. Does this, does this, does this study does this study involve developing pathogens as well? This is what no. a reporter is like, or should be. Then how do you These know what pathogens health. there are? And why is there such panic? What are the pathogens which, which, as it has been said out here, that if these pathogens, if these specific pathogens get away, then they can be very dangerous, which means inside those bio labs in Ukraine, there are some dangerous pathogens. And all of this is happening under the DTRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, right? And uh, the DTRA actually got millions for low visibility chemical and biological search that would meet, quote unquote, specific combatant command requirements, which means they were being used for a military purpose, which means therefore, and I am, I am quoting information that has come from Pentagon, that means millions have gone into the development of low visibility chemical and biological research that will meet specific combatant command requirements, which means they're being used for the US military. There's work that's occurring for defensive purposes as well as public health purposes. The US Department of Defense has more than 100 No, but they're being used for military purposes. See, that systems. is very different, uh, Ms. Parthmore. Ms. Parthmore, I think, I think you need to explain this because you just tried to tell me some time back, in fact, about I'm a minute back, that this it. was for public health, whereas I have come to you and I have, I have just confronted you and said that there has been increased funding for the Nimble Elder Program of the Defense Threat Research Agency, which is driven by, quote unquote, classified Department of Defense guidance. And this is aimed with, uh, with low visibility, low visibility, which means the world should not know, chemical and biological research for military purposes. But you just said public health. This doesn't sound like public health to me at all. What are you doing in it's Ukraine, Ms. Ms. Parthma? Would you, would you care to clarify, please? Because you have used biological weapons and chemical weapons in the past. We're getting very concerned, please. Can you tell us what exactly is going on in the biolabs in Ukraine? 
the United States ceased to have biological and chemical weapons programs after signing on to the Biological Weapons Convention and the Please Chemical wait. Weapons Convention. Because. This work is defensive and for public health purposes, uh, as I've tried to explain. Uh, no, but for military work, use? Uh, but for military use? But for military there's use? No offense, there, but is it for no military offensive use? Offensive military. There is no offense. The military includes humans that, that is, can that be You're telling me it's not offensive, diseases. but yes, for military use. My name is Yvonne Baker. I'm the member of Parliament for Etobicoke Center, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here today at St. Demetrius Ukrainian Catholic Church here in Etobicoke Center. I'd like to start by thanking Prime Minister Trudeau for being with us today to meet with members of the Ukrainian-Canadian community. And whether that's military support, I think all of you know about that, the, the, the lethal and non-lethal uh, 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 resources and, and, and other uh, materials that we've provided. To Canadian the diplomats and soldiers in Ukraine took an unusual meeting in June of 2018, one that's now coming to light. It was a meeting with one of the paramilitary units raised to fight off the Russian invasion of Ukraine's eastern provinces. One problem. That unit, the Azov Battalion, has been linked to neo-Nazism, and the Canadian military knew. An Ottawa citizen report says Canadian forces in Ukraine produced a briefing in 2017 saying members of the Azov Battalion identified themselves as Nazis. But the June 2018 meeting happened anyway, with a Canadian forces colonel and diplomatic staff attending. The battalion published pictures on social media saying Canadian representatives expressed their hopes for, quote, further fruitful cooperation. In a statement, the Department of National Defense says they are strongly opposed to the glorification of Nazism and all forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, intolerance and extremism, adding our official position remains that we are not, nor will we be providing support to Azov and affiliated entities. Brad Galloway with the Center for Hate, Bias and Extremism has studied the Azov Battalion. He says that while some neo-Nazi groups prefer to be discreet with their imagery, the Azov Battalion is more forthright. German news found members of the unit sporting SS symbols and swastikas, and Azov prominently places the wolf's hook and black sun, two symbols favored by the Nazis, on its crest. Maybe there's a wing of them that want to tone it down a little bit so it's playable in North America. I first want to say I, I, I can't imagine what you and the entire community are going through right now. Uh, the mix of emotions, obviously a deep sense of, of sadness that this has come to this, rage uh, that this is, is happening, um, mixed in with perhaps a little bit of pride that the entire world gets to see just how strong and courageous and resilient Ukrainians are, but such a deep sorrow that it had to come to this. Last week, there was controversy in the Greek parliament after members of the opposition party, the uh, Syriza, they are a progressive left-wing party in Greece, stormed out after watching Zelensky appear on the screen to parliament aside two neo-Nazi Azov battalion members. Uh, the leader of the opposition party, uh, his name is Alexis Cyprus. He actually tweeted out uh, this is in Greek, but we are translating as best as possible. It says the speech of members of the neo-Nazi order Azov in the Greek parliament is a challenge. The absolute responsibility lies with the university. Ta I, I'm sure that was translated probably poorly, but he says he talks. He talked about a historic day, but it's a historical shame. Solidarity with Ukrainian people is a given, but the Nazis cannot have a say in parliament. Um, the government spokesperson also came out after this and uh, said that uh, that including a message from an Azov battalion member was wrong and inappropriate. So this is really interesting what has happened. You know, in Greece, they're very pro, you know, they're sympathetic to Ukraine. This particular political party, this progressive political party is very sympathetic to Ukraine, but they are not at all sympathetic to the Azov battalion and the neo-Nazis that have been absorbed into the Ukrainian military. Here in the United States, we don't talk about it much in the mainstream media. They seem to have whitewashed this history. The Greeks have not. 
Uh, they're much more aware of it. There's actually a large Greek population living in Mariupol in Ukraine, which is where this battalion is very heavily centered and has been fighting. And there's been a big civil war in the Donbass region of Ukraine for a long time. Um, and so, you know, Robbie, what do you, this is really interesting that right. the Greeks said, whoa, what is this? Uh, well, not okay, Zelensky. What is happening is an incredible tragedy. A tragedy for the Ukrainian community, tragedy for uh, Ukrainians all around the world, but also a tragedy for the world. And it was very much something that we didn't want to see happen, something that uh, the world has been warned since Crimea, since Crimea, you know, Canada stepped up with Operation Unifier to help uh, train up the Ukrainian military that is right now fighting like lions. We can give thanks to the Canadian uh, armed forces who were there to help give them the tools to show the world what they're made of. Sometimes I feel as though I've got a walk-on part in the first of the Omen films. My world feels so shadowed now by creeping malevolence which is to say ill will and hatred. I barely rule out hiding in my house and papering over the windows. People still write to me most days, often to air their fears about what they see as nothing less than an existential battle between good and evil. More and more, I am inclined to believe them. Loud are the calls for us to go as far as necessary, all the way until Putin and his forces are defeated or dead. More millions of refugees are displaced from all they have known and on the move in hopes of encountering the kindness of strangers. There's not just war in Ukraine, there's also war in Myanmar, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, in many African countries including Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, Nigeria, Congo, Maghreb, Mali and more besides. I've only listed some of the most obvious ongoing horrors. Some of the fighting in those places is decades old, but mostly we don't watch anymore because our media don't show it to us. Sons inherit the hatreds of their fathers. Daughters bury the bodies of their children, just as other mothers buried their children in their own time. I'm ashamed to admit I don't think enough about the suffering of others. I am unforgivably aware that unforgivable wrong and despicable cruelty is endured right now, this very moment, by millions of people around the world, while I shop online and keep my head bent over my smartphone. I will never be able to atone for what I turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to now, and have done all of my adult life. It might have been Plato who said, only the dead have seen the end of war. Whoever it was, we have known the truth of the statement for a long time. War is always with us. Since the outbreak of war in 1914, what we called the Great War until we learned we had to give them numbers, there have been precious few days without organised armed conflict somewhere. Malevolence and hatred are nothing new either, of course they aren't. But just as war is growing bolder yet again, talk of a new world war indeed so the practice of malevolent behaviour and its attendant expressions of hatred is on the rise again as well. Most sinister, hatred and calls for death are being normalised in the online world, even actively encouraged. Facebook and Instagram announced last week they would be allowing users to call for death and violence towards Russian soldiers. Normally so-called hate speech is banned from such platforms. But the American parent company Meta have relaxed their hate speech policy in a dozen countries in Eastern Europe and Caucasus, so long as the hatred is directed only at Russian soldiers. Death to the Russian invaders, it seems, would be okay by Meta. The Canadian diaspora over the years has been connecting and building such deeper ties between Canada and Ukraine, whether it's the Canada-Ukraine free trade deal, whether it's increasing economic or cultural partnerships. Uh, every year uh, on, on the House of, uh, in, in Parliament, uh, the Ukrainian interns are everywhere uh, and an incredible sign of not just the connection, but the work we're doing together to build a better democracy, a better country, a better path 
forward in Ukraine, done by Ukrainians themselves. And the success of Ukraine over the past years in building this extraordinary country, this strength of pathway that is impressive, well, that was a direct threat to Vladimir Putin's view of authoritarian and Russian dominance. Marked by well-known and widespread fraud. In the 2004 election, multiple foreign observers noted voter intimidation and direct electoral fraud in favor of Yanukovych. This prompted countrywide riots known as the Orange Revolution. In the face of these riots, the Ukrainian Supreme Court nullified the results of the election and ordered a second vote to be taken, which Yanukovych's opponent ultimately won. Another area of corruption is Ukraine's court system which, unlike most developed countries, does not, in practice, operate under a separation of powers. Judges are regularly pressured by high-ranking government officials to vote in their favor, or to pass down lenient sentences to their associates. And despite an anti-corruption push in 2010, leading to hundreds of criminal cases against active officials, very few were ultimately prosecuted. A 2009 poll found that fewer than one in three Ukrainians believe it's possible to get a fair trial. Ukraine has an enormous number of problems, from widespread alcoholism to a deeply insufficient healthcare system, failing infrastructure, and as of 2016, seemingly no reduction in corruption. WikiLeaks revealed that the U.S. considers the country a kleptocracy, that is, government by thieves. Ukraine's newest president, Petro Poroshenko, is an oligarch and businessman who's known as the Chocolate King for his ownership of the largest confectionery manufacturer in the country. Despite his promises to crack down on corruption, many believe that Ukraine will continue to be the most corrupt country in Europe. Are you on Snapchat? So are we. And we're telling really, really cool stories that you won't hear anywhere else. Do us a favor, open up your Snapchat app, pause the video, and scan this code. We want to know what you think. Thanks for watching Secret Daily. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos every day.